Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, depending on what time you're watching this. Good to have you back with us. We uh, we want to talk a, a little more today about words. Uh, we've looked over the last couple of weeks about how you know faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, I find it interesting that um, when we talk about word, words, um, I remember as a kid, you hear that little, um, that little saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You may have heard that before. You may have said it before. And that's like this, you know, this fake armor as a kid whenever people are trying to pick on you or say things and you go, ah, oh, you know, well, sticks and stones, words will never hurt me. Uh, yet that is very untrue. Words have a, a great deal of power. I don't find it... I don't find it uh, coincidental that God spoke and created. And then in John, when John introduces Jesus from the very beginning, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, that Jesus is called the Word of God. David, in, in Psalm 119, dedicates this entire psalm to God's laws, His precepts, to His Word. And in, and in it, he says at one point, Your Word I have hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Your Word, what you said, means so much to me that I will put it in my heart and let it guide my life. Have you ever had a time when someone said something to you that turned your world upside down? I had a... There were, there were two guys that I grew up with, uh, Rocky and Danny. And from whenever uh, we went to church together, whenever we were little kids, both of us were, or all three of us were born within, I don't know, a year and a half of each other. And... And so we were always around each other. And these two guys, uh, to one degree or another, um, were my long-standing friends. And I remember, I remember about four years ago, my, my mom gave me a phone call. And she just said simply, Danny has died. This guy was 43 or 44 years old, 43 years old. It was his birthday, had just turned 43. came out of nowhere, rocked me. I remember a moment of shock and then and then I fell to my knees in tears. Here was one of the pillars of my friendship, right? These are, I had two guys that had been my friends my entire life. They'd been there for me. To, to one extent or another over the years. One phone call, one message changed something about me. 
And now I am different. I am an altered person from what I was before. You see? Words have a great power to them. And I'm sure you've probably heard things once or twice that have, that have struck you. I want to go back to where we left off last week in, in Acts chapter 2. It was on the day of Pentecost. You know, the Holy Spirit came, got the attention. People were speaking in, in, in tongues. Folks were hearing in their own native language. Uh, it was a, a wild moment there. Everybody's attention was, was gotten by the Holy Spirit was gotten. That's not even grammatically correct. And right now, I don't even know what the correct thing is. Janet Kahn, if you can put a comment below if you if you watch this. Anyway, the attention, people's attention had been, had been ensnared by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is using this moment to give words to these people. Something that they needed to hear. Peter stands up. That's what's recorded uh, by our brother Luke. Peter stands up and has this, this sermon that at the end of it, he lays Jesus' blood on their, on their heads. You did this. You turned the Messiah, the King, over into godless hands. The Romans. And they killed him. That's on you. And it says, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. Pierced to the heart. And, and I don't think that, that we nowadays can, can understand the severity of what Peter laid on these people. I don't think we can, we can adequately uh, understand what it was about this statement Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified, right? And, and we talk about it. You know, we could talk about it. Our sin put him on the cross. You know, my, my sin, uh, you know, he went to the cross because of me, because of my sin. And we could say things like that. But these people were there present, crying out, Give us Barabbas. What do you want me to do with this man? Crucify him. And when they hear that this person that they had called out for his blood, this was actually the one who they had been hoping would come to set them free. There is, there is something that hits them that, that I don't think we can understand because we're not in that context, right? But their hearts were pierced. Their emotional center was broken. Their spirit impoverished. And they cry out. They say to they say to Peter, Brethren, what shall we do? Brothers, brothers, you 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 our fellow Jews you who, who know what's going on here, tell us, 
What are we going to do? What can we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, all that the Lord will call to Himself. All that the Lord our God will call to Himself. So God is going to continue doing this calling, right? Jesus is going to continue doing this calling. The same calling that is within the message that Peter gave is going to continue on, right? Because there are other people who need to have their hearts pierced so that they can come to God and be forgiven, you see. And, and you, your children, and anybody else that God wants to call, you got to change your allegiances. you got to change your mind about who you are. And it says be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, right? So we got to be baptized. we got to take on His name in baptism is what it says. And it said, and he kept on, he kept on telling them um, in verse forty to be saved from this perverse generation. So these words are powerful. What I want to look at now is. If these words were so powerful, what happened to the people? If this is something that changed their heart, changed their mind, changed their allegiance, what then did they start doing? Because because it, it, it's interesting. In Acts 1.1, Luke says that in the first account of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So the two things come together, right? There is teaching, but then there's doing. There's the words, but then there's the actions. So what I want to look at for a moment is, is, is there a picture of of what went on, of what these, these people's lives were like after their heart was pierced and they took on Christ. Well, let's read verses 41 through 47 of Acts chapter 2. So then those who had received his word, <laughs> received his word, right? Those that, that took to heart his word, they were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They, these people, were continually devoting themselves. Now, let's, I want to stop there for a second. Continually devoting themselves. Something about the message that they received changed them so much that they were continually devoting who they are. My life, my actions, my thoughts, my way of being are now devoted continually Two, and then he gives four things. He says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. More words, right? They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship with all the others that were fellow believers, to the breaking of bread, what we now would call the Lord's Supper. And to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. 
and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed, believed the words, the words that had called them, all those who had believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so, I don't know what the lives of these people were like beforehand. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it looked like. But what I do know is when they heard this message and they believed it, and they decided that they wanted to take this, this opportunity of salvation that had been offered... It changed who they were. And they wanted to know more about, about what we now have believed. Can I, can I, get, can I, can I get some more understanding about the, the surrounding evidence, please? The apostles' teaching. Fellowship. Hey, while we're with each other, we talk to each other. And we, and we, and we, and we share the things about our faith. Now, it's interesting to me that over in um, in the book of John, chapter 15, you know what, let's just turn there real quick. It's only a few pages back. Jesus, in talking with his disciples, says this about friendship. About friendship. He says this. Um... Hang on just one moment. i got to find it. Verse, uh, I'll, I'll start with verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what the master is doing, but I've called you my friends. Check this out. For all things that I have heard from my Father... I have made known to you. I call you my friends because I've shared the Father with you. And it's implied that they accepted it, right? They accepted what the Father has said. And he says, and everything that I do, everything I've commanded you to do, you, you have joined with me in this. And since you have joined with me in this, and you've accepted my Father, you're now my friends. And we have a bond that, that, nothing, that nothing can take away. And in the same way in the early church, these people had fellowship with each other. A fellowship that's based on what they believed. And there was a sharing of that message and the teaching of the apostles and what they're learning and what they're believing and what is changing them from the inside out. And they're taking of the Lord's Supper and they're remembering this thing. And then it says that they were praying. You see, words. Not just words coming from God to us. Not just words shared among each other. But, but also, my words spoken back to God about whatever. It really doesn't matter. God wants to hear them all. He wants to hear your stories. He wants to hear your hurts. He wants to hear your fears. He wants to hear everything that you've got. And as we come together and we share fears and we share hurts and we share those things, you know what? Let us share together our prayers to God. Words have power. Words have power to build up, to unify, to strengthen. 
to convict and change. Isn't it a, isn't it a funny thing that Jesus is the Word of God? the power of creation residing within our Savior. The power to bind us together, to save us, to call us, and to change us. I want to share one, one last um one last passage, and it's it's from uh, Isaiah 66. Um, there there's some people who who are thinking they're all they're all great, and and God's uh, lucky to have them on His team. <laughs> and He says, and 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 God says this in verse 66, or uh, Isaiah 66, uh, verse two, at the end of it. But to this one I will look. You want to know who God's interested in? To this one I will look. To him who is humble, who is contrite or broken of spirit, and who trembles at my words. When's the last time have you trembled at the word of God? Have you heard something from God that changed you, that pierced your heart and convicted you? Your word I've hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Hmm. Something to think about for the week. I love you. And God loves you too. And I thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Now we're going to take a moment to uh, remember Jesus' death and take of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Um, we're, we're talking about words, and Jesus said some things whenever he was on the cross that are recorded. One of the things that I want to uh, highlight the words that Jesus said, uh, some of the words that Jesus said, have to do with his character and, and really his mission um, and who we're called to be in light of what he's done. In Luke 23, Starting in verse 33, it says this. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, as they're taking him, now get this, as they're taking Jesus with criminals, and they take him to this place of execution and they nail him to this cross naked and brutalized. But Jesus was saying, they were mocking, but Jesus was saying, they were brutal, but Jesus was saying, they had murder intent in their heart. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It didn't matter what was in their hearts. 
It didn't matter what they what they recognized about their behavior, their actions. Jesus' plea to God the Father was on their behalf. Forgive them, for they don't know what it is that they're doing. They're ignorant. They're just foolish children, and, and they don't understand what's really going on. And that's the heart of Jesus to us, you see. That's the very heart that prompted him to come and, and, and do this for us. That whatever it is that we do or that we engage in or that we, we, uh, we, we, we find ourselves bogged down by in life, Jesus is there saying, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And I believe that that's a message that is continuing on over each and every one of us. I hope, I hope that's the message that Jesus is saying to God. Whenever God looks down and he sees this old fellow and he's like, Oh, I can just imagine God the Father shaking his head and going, Oh my goodness, what am I going to do with that boy? And Jesus, my older brother, my big brother, says, Dad, give him a break because he doesn't understand. Because that's his heart towards us, evidenced by the fact that he gave his life so that you and I could be bought out of sin's hands. He gave his life so that we could have a covenant based on forgiveness with our God and Creator. And now is the time when we get to remember that big brother who has that heart, who cries out for forgiveness. And we take of this bread and we remember his body. Would you pray with me over this bread? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your wondrous love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness given to us in your Son, Jesus. We pray that as we will take this bread, that you'll bless it and help it to be a, a commemoration of what Jesus has done for us and that we could be pricked in our hearts to draw closer to him in our walk. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now would you pray with me over the cup? Once again, Lord, we come to you thanking you for Jesus and the price that he paid on our behalf. We ask now that you bless this cup so that it would be a reminder of the forgiveness that we have by the shed of his blood and the promise that you will always forgive us and that you're never going to leave us and that Jesus loves us so, so much. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to leave you today with Psalm 19, verse 14. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable unto you, O my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. But I want to leave it with you like this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O my Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O my Lord. God bless you all. Have a great week.